Thank you. Thank you for coming today. We're going to talk about veterinary dentistry, and um, they already heard me tell them that I work at Kansas State at the vet school, and I teach uh, fourth year veterinary students in the clinical setting, seeing patients, uh, doing dentistry work and primary care, and, um, and then I do some of the third year lectures for the um, medicine two students uh, on dentistry. Do you guys have any pets? Mm -hmm. Yep, what do you have? We have Beagle and a long haired cat. Excellent, okay. I have a bunny. You have a bunny? Okay, excellent. I have just a mud dog and a short haired cat. Nice. Well, some of our topics will pertain to you as pet owners. Okay, so when you think about so I probably need to click on the slide and so that it was working earlier. <laughs> I think it's when I hit the record button. There you try that. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So what is the goal of veterinary dentistry? Our goal is to improve the lives of our patients by um, identifying disease in our patient's mouth treating it appropriately, um, and preventing disease. Because what we want is our pets to live in comfort, and we want them have, to have a good quality of life. And so when you think of veterinary dentistry, who comes to mind? Who is the patient you think of? Maybe this one. This, this animal lives at your house, right? So they have dental needs. And how about this guy, right? These little short-nosed dogs, oh, they have lots of dental needs. So he should be um, very cute to look at, right? Love them, so adorable, bad mouths, need lots of care. How about him, right? So as a as his veterinarian, and we are trained to help all sorts of animals, and you have the opportunity to um, investigate special interests that you have. So you can specialize or you can treat a variety of patients, and horses have some fairly specific dental needs. Bunnies, bunnies for sure have dental needs. With proper or improper care, sometimes their um, teeth issues become quite a um, uh, problem for them to actually even prehend or get their food. How about him? Right? These guys, captive cats, they have lots of trouble with their teeth. Um, and we have, we have very limited ability to help them. And so being aware of what their problems and needs are go a long way for us to provide the appropriate care. <laughs> Him too, right? So we have the opportunity to see a huge variety of patients, and with comes with the variety of patients comes um, specific individual nuances with different breeds and, and different species, different breeds within species, um, um, and it can be very interesting. We get to treat them all, which is so nice. But depending on your interest, where you may narrow down your scope of patients that you see, just so you can have uh, the adequate knowledge you need to treat them. Okay, common dog problems. Periodontal disease. Do you guys know periodontal diseases? Yep. What's that? It's where the gums have proceeded so bad that teeth have become loose. Right. Before. Right, so periodontal disease is infection up under the gum line caused by plaque bacteria, and plaque is that little, that's, plaque is that soft sweater that's knitted on your teeth that you wake up with in the morning, right? So you wake up in the morning and you go, oh, okay, I gotta brush my teeth, that's what plaque is, okay. So for us, we brush our teeth every day, to help prevent periodontal disease. Many of our patients' owners are unaware that that's the best way to prevent periodontal disease for their pets. And you can see that there are a variety of survey studies that are available, but that a fair amount of them have some degree of periodontal disease at a pretty early age. And that may be anything as mild as gingivitis to something more severe. Tooth fracture, they, they break their teeth with some regularity. It can be because of what they eat or what they chew on or if it's a traumatic event. Um, tumors within their mouths, this can be another problem for them. 
Um, some are benign, meaning they don't metastasize to distant locations and locally cause a problem, and some of them can be quite aggressive cancers. Endodontic disease, anybody know what endodontic disease? Uh, I could make, make a guess. Go ahead. Like tooth disease? With the inside the tooth, exactly. So if anybody's had a root canal, that's because you've had endodontic disease. So the pulp, which is in the very center of the tooth, which is the area that keeps the tooth alive, becomes injured, traumatized, bruised, and it dies or becomes infected, and then you have disease within the tooth. Um, and persistent deciduous teeth, really common in little toy root dogs. So here's some pictures for us. So this is a nice mouth healthy. We have, you can see, we have nice pink gingiva here. It's just bleeding a little bit right here. We have very little plaque in calculus. He's broken the very tip of his tooth off right here, but overall he looks pretty good, and we would like everybody to look this, this healthy. Unfortunately, sometimes that's what we see. And oftentimes our owners don't know this is happening, and the reason is because they're not looking. Why would you look? They're usually eating fine and feeling good and acting what the owners think is pretty normal. And so unless you lift up their lip and look under there, you might not realize this is going on. This is pretty severe advanced periodontal disease, and some um, clues of what's going on here are that you can see how red the gingiva is, right? It's really angry. It's not that nice pink look to it. It looks kind of rounded and swollen in areas. That's signs of chronic inflammation causing that tissue to swell. We have heavy calculus, and calculus itself is not necessarily a huge problem, but it retains all the plaque, and the plaque proliferating, that bacteria causes lots of troubles. And you can see right here, the plaque is now purulent and oozing out from under the gum line. And so just think about, that's what you can see, and unfortunately what you can't see under the gum line is progression of that infection. Here are some x-rays. So for our patients, they come and we um, anesthetize them because we can't, they won't hold still and say ah for us, right? So we have to anesthetize them so we can adequately evaluate their mouths. So they will, um, while they're anesthetized, we will take the dental probe and we'll probe all around under their teeth. This is for our small animal patients mostly. Um, and then we take some x-rays. And the x-rays help us decide putting together the information from looking at it, probing their mouths, and the x-rays really help us to know what's going on. So what you can see from these x-rays um, are that the bone is the white color here, and the tooth is also white because it's real mineralized, and the mineral shows up as white. The air shows up as dark. And the bone should come down here and cover all of the roots, like this, right here. So you can see that we have white, we have uh, dark areas here where there should be none. What this means is the infection has come under the gum line and it's caused the bone to recede away. And all of this, all the way to the root tip, is filled with infection. So these four guys are going to look like our picture that we had the slide before. You can see here on this tooth that not only do we have lots of bone loss here, the bone should be up at this height, and it should be as dense as it is down here. So we have that happening, filled with lots of um, purulent plaque material, and we also have endodontic disease. So this tooth has become infected not only on the outside, but it's become infected up in the pulp canal here. And it has caused an abscess down here, and that chronic infection is causing the bone to be resorbed and move away from that area, creating a focal pocket of infection there. And these are some more pictures for, um, of the front part of their teeth, so their jaws. So this is his canine tooth, an upper canine tooth, and these are the lower canine teeth. Here are his incisors. Canine teeth are the fang teeth, the big ones up front. Incisors are the little guys in between the canines on top and bottom. 
This is top, this is bottom. This is a small toy breed dog, and they have really considerable struggles with periodontal disease. And you can see again that the bone has receded. It should be up here at this level, right here. And these guys look like they're almost waving at you, right? Because they're right here, that's the edge of the bone. And the bone, I can't reach that one, so let's see if I can do that. The bone should be upwards in this area. So clues in their mouth that this is a problem for them, their teeth may be loose, their gingiva might recede, like you were talking about, you might have a heavy calculus and lots of plaque um, that <clears throat> um, are problematic for them. Persistent deciduous teeth. Have you guys had a dog that's had that happen where they keep their baby teeth? No? Okay. Really common in little toy breed dogs. The 15 pound and under crowd, this happens too regularly. It can happen to other dogs and it does happen to cats occasionally, but not near as commonly as little dogs. And um, for them, this is a problem because they have little tiny mouths, right? Little five pound dogs have little tiny mouths. And they come with the same 42 teeth that large dogs do. So you've got a lot of teeth that you're trying to smoosh into these little tiny mouths. Their teeth are big compared to their jaws, too. So their maxilla and mandibles aren't very big with these big teeth in there. Um, and then they keep them, so now it's all crowded. So you can see they're all smooshed together here like this, all smooshed together. And this is a baby tooth right here, and here is a baby tooth right here. They look a little different than the adult teeth, but they cause crowding. And they're not really designed to stay there for the lifetime of the pet because um, they're supposed to be exfoliated and then the, the um, adult to take that place. And when that happens, they stay, then it causes even more crowding. You can have troubles with periodontal disease as you might see uh, material and debris collect in these locations, but you can also appreciate now the gap right here is not very wide. And that gap is where the lower mandibular, the bottom canine fang tooth, is supposed to come up and ride between those two teeth. So now when you have extra teeth, the teeth aren't really in the right spot, and it can cause some troubles with them being able to open and close their mouths without having it be painful for them, without their teeth hitting their teeth or hitting the roof of their mouth. So would you extract those uh, yeah. teeth? Yep. Yeah. So we're, we would recommend extracting the these guys as mm -hmm. soon as it you recognize that they haven't lost them. So this is a common thing for us to do for little seven or eight month old dogs that you say, oh, look, he's not losing his teeth. We should extract those before they cause a problem for him. Complicated crown fractures. So we talked about tooth fracture as being a common problem for dogs. Um, this is a really probably the most common um, broken tooth I see. And this is their carnasial tooth, the upper big one um, in their mouth. So you pull their lip back and you look there and that's their big chewing tooth on the top. Um, they grab a hold of things, they put it way back in the back of their mouth, wedge it there, and then they chew on it, right? That's what your dog does, right? gets his toy and his stick and he sits it back there and he chews on it. And if they chew on things too hard, they catch the, the tip of the crown right here and they, and they bite down really hard and then it just breaks off the whole side of the tooth. And what's amazing to me is they don't really tell us they do this. So most of the time I find this problem when they're coming in for an unrelated reason. They need their vaccines, they need their heartworm tests, they've hurt themselves, we'll do a complete physical exam, and this is when we usually find these problems. But what you can see is that probe right there is sticking into the inside of his tooth. That's where the pulp sits, and so the inside of his tooth is now on the outside. And the problem with that is, all the oral bacteria in their mouths are now traveling up that to cause infection for that too. There's another example of oral masses in their mouth. He has really severe periodontal disease too, doesn't he? But unfortunately, we see tumors in their mouths with some regularity. Cat problems, similar. Um, you know, they still have trouble with periodontal disease, but maybe um, not to the degree that some of our dogs do. Uh, but do not forget that some individuals really still struggle with periodontal disease. And <clears throat> toothbrushing is the answer for that. 
tooth fracture. Resorptive lesions, there is a study that showed that talked about 28% at the low end of our house cats will get one of these lesions in the future. That's a really high percentage of our cats that get these. We don't really know why they get them. And it actually basically means that the tooth is being turned into either the surrounding bone or just like a hole is eaten in the tooth, it's being eaten away. And sometimes these can be quite painful for our, our population. We really don't have an answer for why um, these occur, and I'm going to show you some examples coming up here. Stomatitis, um, which means inflammation in their mouths, um, and I've got another slide for you, and they can also have uh, oral tumors grow as well. So here's an example of a fractured um, upper left canine tooth. So this patient came in, um, he came in for an annual exam. And the owner did not recognize that he was having any problems eating. When we lifted his lip up to look at his tooth, we noticed that the tip of it was broken. And just the very tip of it was broken, and this is a problem for cats, that their pulp canal goes way to the very tip of their fang tooth, within a millimeter or two of the tip. So they really don't have to break much off, and then they've got a problem on the inside of their tooth. Um, but when we lifted up the lip even farther, we noticed that he had a draining tract. Do you guys know what a draining tract is? It's where infection finds its way out. So instead of maybe draining around the tooth, it's created a tract out the side of the gum line to allow it to drain for purulent material to drain out. So that was our first clue that there was a big problem going on with this tooth. So, um, we decided we were going to clean his teeth and investigate it further, and this is what his x-ray looked like. So, this is his, his fang tooth right here. Here's the fracture down here. This is where the bacteria enter the pulp canal right here, and the pulp should stay fairly similar width all the way down to the root tip. So, you can see that it starts off kind of narrow here. Oh, if you look over here, you can see the pulp canal here is narrow all the way to the bottom, right? Pretty narrow. This one starts off narrow and then it gets wider. And then we have this big area right here, very wide. All of that is filled with infection. So that is our indication that that tooth is infected on the inside. This is an example of resorptive lesions. Again, we don't really know why cats get these. They come in three types, type 1, 2, or 3. Um, <clears throat> depends on what type they have to what we're going to do with them. They can cause the pet to be painful. So as you can imagine, right here, this is our resorptive lesion right here um, that you're looking at the tooth. You can imagine that sensory information from your mouth, what you're eating and drinking and temperature and pressure sensation, is going to enter through the enamel, because the enamel is a hard covering of your tooth that protects your teeth, right? So if part of that covering is missing, now sensory information makes its way through the dentin into stimulating your pulp, and that can be quite uncomfortable for them. And then you can see, although this lesion does not look particularly big here on the tooth, we have a lot of tooth that's missing right here. So we have a very large lesion there. And um, unfortunately, we don't have any treatment options for this other than extraction. So a um, long time ago, we used to try to fill these, and we found that this just continues to progress, so we don't put fillings in these. This is a picture of stomatitis in cats. Um, we don't, again, we don't really have a good handle on why cats have this problem. but. These are cats that owners bring them in because they don't feel good. Their mouths hurt. They don't want to eat, or they're eating funny, or they're dropping their food, or they're drooling, or they're not grooming themselves, and they kind of laying around, you know, when cats don't feel good, they might hide behind the couch, or they might just not be doing their regular cat things and be quite as interactive. Most time, owners recognize these cats have some troubles. And what you can see is they have terrible inflammation in their mouth. Terrible inflammation that covers oftentimes most of the, goes all the way around the teeth and back here in the back part of your mouth, back here. 
I can't even really imagine how bad that would feel because if I have a little kink or sore, I'm pretty much a really whiny baby about how uncomfortable it is, and I can't even imagine if most of my mouths felt like a kink or sore. Um, they, we don't really know what turns this on and off, so most of the time they live most of their life fairly normal, and then all of a sudden their owners are recognizing that this is a problem for them, so that's why they're bringing them in. Um, if home care, tooth brushing, special diets, tooth brushing is probably the most important part to keeping this at bay. If that doesn't work, unfortunately, most of the time we end up taking most of their teeth out. And the thought is, after you take their teeth out, that if we reduce the plaque covering their teeth, we get rid of most of their inflammation. And they feel so much better after their inflammation resolves, they go back to feeling and acting much more normal. This is an example of an um, aggressive oral tumor in a cat. And you can see here that this has a proliferative amylitic lesion. So the normal height of the bone should be about right like this. So we have extra bone. And then the bone isn't as dense as it should be. So the bone itself is responded to the cancer by producing a little extra and also getting kind of eaten away by it all at the same time. This unfortunate cat has had teeth break off secondary to it and it ended up with really severe infection around the teeth as well. Cats, unfortunately, get oral tumors with some regularity. They tell us they don't feel good. You might see an, smell an odor com coming from their mouths. They might not eat as well because they usually don't feel quite so good because of their tooth. Horses. Guys, no horses, right? No horses. Okay. So horses, they too, common um, pet, they have problems. They, they oftentimes have a job though, right? So not only is their job to be your pet, but they may have other things they're required to do. And most of the time that requires them to hold a bit in their mouth and be be um, amenable to being saddled and haltered, um, and then they have to be in fairly good body condition so they can get their job done as well. Um, and so lots of their common dental disease problems might prevent them from accepting a bit because it might be uncomfortable, or they might not want to eat as much as they need to, um, or be able to digest their food quite as well as they should. Um, so. He, this person is checking the occlusion. So the occlusion of their mouth is how their teeth fit together. When they open and close their mouth, how they fit together like that. And how they fit together makes a big difference in how they function. So they gotta be able to open and close properly to gather their food. They have to open and close properly to chew their food. And so they fit fairly nicely up front here. But in the back, darn it, he's got points on his teeth. So can you see right here, these sharp edges? Right there, right. So what's happening is the horse's teeth are sitting like this, and he should be taking his grass in, his hay, and he should be grinding his hay like this, right? He should be chewing his food and grinding his hay. And what's happened is now, because he has points on one side where the teeth are sticking up, now he can't do this, so now he's forced to only chew his food like this. And unfortunately, what happens then is that it wears these teeth more and creates these points to be even sharper and more painful and further reduce their ability to chew their food. Um, unfortunately, when this happens, sometimes they end up with wounds on the side of their cheeks when they're trying to chew and that cheek, cheek tissue gets kind of caught in there. Um, and so our solution to this is to float their teeth. Have you ever heard of people having their horse's teeth floated? And what that means is we're going to help them flatten those points out. And so two ways we do this. One is with a power float. This little invention has saved lots of people's arms because before it was the manual float. Oops, sorry, the manual float. So you had to take it and file their teeth down. File their teeth down. Now you can push a button and it files their teeth down for you. Okay, so this picture is 
you can see the horse. Um, he has been sedated. He's been sedated so one, he'll hold still, and two, he won't be frightened by what's going on. We want him to be not afraid of us or what's happening. He's standing in the stocks here. So this is just a metal um, cage-like um, apparatus that you walk them in so they can't back out or move to the side and they'll stay still for you. He's in a, um, he's in this head holding device here to try to keep his head straight. And then he's got a speculum in his mouth right here. And what that does is just partially open his jaw so we can get in his mouth and do what we need to do. So what this person is doing, he's holding the float right here and he's looking back in his mouth at his cheek teeth. And then he's wearing his flashlight on his forehead so he can see what he's doing. Because it is a dark cavern back in there, and if you can't see what you're doing, um, then you can't do an adequate job. So we need to make sure we have the equipment to be able to do what we need to do. This is done on a regular basis for people who have horses. Bunnies, probably the, the biggest part of uh, problems for bunnies is they have ever-growing teeth, right? So designed to eat really fibrous food, right? In nature, they eat a bunch of grass. And grass is really fibrous and hard on their teeth, and so it wears their teeth down, so their teeth keep growing in response to being worn down, that they need to keep growing so they have teeth to grind their food up. In, in our pet bunnies, if they're not offered a lot of hay material, if they're not offered a lot of fibrous material, then they don't grind their teeth down as much as quickly as they grow. And luckily for our pet bunnies, they might live a little longer than the wild bunnies do, right? So we want them to live a long time to be our pets, but that means we have to help maintain their oral cavity by having appropriate food for them. So you can see in this picture, this bunny, his lower teeth and upper teeth have overgrown um, so much that he's having a hard time opening his mouth to even get the food in now, right? So bunny teeth are different than dog and cat teeth in that one, they're ever growing, right? So dog and cat teeth like ours, yeah, what you come with is what you get. They don't, if you break it, it doesn't grow back. Um, but it also means that their pulp situation is a little bit different as well. So when their teeth are overgrowing like this, we can cut them off and not cause problems within the pulp. We can cut them off down here. So um, now they can open and close their teeth, open and close their mouths, and they can adequately pretend their food normally then. They also have troubles with their cheek teeth just like horses do. So you can see that he's got little spurs over here, little points on this side, and then you've got points on the mandibular teeth or the lower jaw teeth right there. And again, those might pinch his, pinch his cheeks, pinch his tongue, and he might not be wanting to eat as well, and it's going to inhibit this action, right? So when you see your bunny eating, this is going on, isn't it? He's got his hay in his mouth, and he's doing this, and then he's doing this, and he's getting it all worked out, and that might really inhibit that. So what we do for them is very similar to the horses. So they get a little sedated, so they will hold still, and it won't frighten them. And then we um, lay them on their tummies, and they have this speculum device that holds their mouth open slightly. So these, these speculum devices aren't meant to crank their mouths open because that's really uncomfortable, right? Like when you go to the dentist and you have to hold your mouth open wide for a long time, it hurts. And it hurts for a while afterwards. So these are just designed to hold their mouths open enough for us to be able to see in there, but not really jack them wide open. And then we have a little light, and now they have a light on the end of a power float, which is a smaller version to what the horse has, and you can get in there and you can um, file those sharp points down for them, and then they're more willing to accept their hay that they need. Not only do they need hay to keep their teeth um, worn down appropriately, but they need hay for proper digestion, right? Your bunny needs adequate hay so he has proper GI home. So it all interconnects, and it's very important for them to feel good. 
wildlife. So um, if you have an interest in exotics and wildlife, um, dental issues are a big concern for our zoo population. We have the ability to daily take care of our pet population, but the zoos are, are not, don't have that hands-on ability. And they found that captive um, apes really struggled with periodontal disease, just like you or I would if we didn't brush our teeth every day. So they're eating um, foods that um, are promoting periodontal disease and cavities, right? They like sugary foods and they like um, fruits and things like that. And if they don't brush their teeth every day, this is problematic. So what they decided, zookeepers were very ingenious, they decided we could, they could train them, they could bribe them to let us brush their teeth every day. So there are a set of apes that will, most zoos try to train their large apes to come and either get their teeth brushed or do it themselves. <laughs> so we're trying to prevent all the problems that we might have if we never brushed our teeth in their population. Now, some of them are going to be trainable to do this, right? Some of them are going to find this an opportunity to do something and be interactive and stimulating, and some animals are not capable of being trained to brush their teeth. They may not be able to apprehend the toothbrush um, adequately either. Do you guys have any questions? Not yet. Okay. Okay. So we'll go through a couple cases that have come to the clinic, and that way you can see what I do every day. So. Um, Buffy came in, um, this is Buffy here, and she was, um, owner thought she was feeling okay, but had this sore underneath her eye right there, you can see it, pointing to it right here. It had, been, it had been there for quite a while, months, and they didn't quite know what was causing it. And when they put them on antibiotics, it would scab up, and then it would heal up, and it would go away, and then they'd stop antibiotics, and a couple weeks later, a new scab would form, and then... Then it would open up and ooze, and when you pushed on it, she didn't like it, and she kind of turned her head away, and <clears throat> um, stuff, pus would kind of come out a little bit with you pushed on it too hard. And so we were suspicious. We had ruled out other reasons for what, uh, what might be causing this, so we were suspicious that maybe she had a tooth problem. And so we anesthetized her and cleaned her teeth, and you can see, after we cleaned the calculus off, because this was covered by calculus, so you couldn't really see that this was happening, but she has broken her tooth right here, and then her pulp is exposed right there. So with this information and this information, and then we got this information. So this is her x-ray um, of that tooth. And what you can see, and standing back here, you can see it even better, See these dark halos around the root tips right here? Kind of looks like a little halo here and here. Those are where the abscess is, is sitting. So those areas, we have decreased bone around the apices of the root and indicative of a tooth root abscess because she's broken her tooth. So at this point, Buffy's owners were offered um, to either extract the tooth because when you extract the tooth, you've gotten rid of the infection that's up in the tooth that's causing this problem, so you can get rid of it, and then the body can heal up the rest of the tissue. Or we can do a root canal. And doing a root canal, instead of getting rid of the whole tooth, you're getting rid of the infected stuff that's up within the pulp, within the, root, the pulp canal system, which is in the inside of the tooth. So instead of the whole tooth going away, you make some, uh, you take a tiny little file and you file and remove all the necrotic debris out of the inside of the tooth and then you fill it up. And then you close it up and you put a crown on the top of it and then she would get to keep her tooth and be able to function with that. Her owner opted for an extraction and so this is the uh, um, uh, x-ray after the extraction and you can see where her roots had been, right here and here, and now they're completely gone. And if you want to go back and look at the other one, so this tooth has three roots. There's one root, and two roots, and three roots. And then after extraction, all three roots are gone. And then after 
um, a couple weeks after well, our, our extraction, Buffy's owner reported that she was feeling great. She didn't realize she wasn't feeling good to begin with because it had such a slow onset for her. Her owners didn't know that she wasn't feeling quite right until so she got to feeling much better. And she thought she had more energy and she was playing with the dogs like she hadn't done in several months. And the wound at the, um, the tr draining tract wound on the outside of her face had completely healed up. So this is a great day for us. This is a great day because we feel like our patients came with a problem and we were able to successfully resolve it and they go home and have a good quality of life. Fluffy. Fluffy came because um, she was in need of a wellness exam and her owner thought she was doing pretty good until we start asking some questions. So part of my job is to get a history from my owners and sometimes the owners don't realize what information they have until we start asking them questions. And part of the questions we ask them every time is, how are they eating? How are they feeling? Are they having vomiting, diarrhea? Are they drinking normally? Are they going outside to go to the bathroom normally? And our owner said, she thought she was pretty good, but she used to hear her crunching her food, and she just doesn't really think she's crunching her food quite as much. And she thought that she wasn't eating her food all at once. So she used to run to the bowl and eat all her food up, and now she'd kind of come to the bowl, and then she'd leave, and then she'd come back. And kind of throughout the day, she ate her food, but it wasn't really fast like, it used, like she used to. She hasn't lost any weight, and she thought she was grooming herself normally, um, and she thought she was using a litter box. This isn't fluffy. <laughs> and what we found was that she had this problem with her tooth. So she's missing a tooth down here, and this tooth does not look very normal. So although this tooth right here should be smaller than this tooth, you should be able to see the crown of it. And you can, can't hardly even see the crown because the gingerbread has grown over the top of it, right? So it's kind of hiding under there. And it's also kind of red on the back side of it. So that's our first clue of that something might not be quite right for her. And so we anesthetized her. As you can see there, she's intubated. And we probed around her teeth, cleaned them, and took some x-rays. And this is what we found. She had a resorptive lesion. So my arrow is pointing to the resorptive lesion right here. See right there? So on the tooth next to it right here, you can see the crown of the tooth should be white like that because it's really mineral dense. And it's uniformly white except for where the pulp is in the middle of it. Right here, and that looks normal. And on this tooth, you can see this side of the crown looks pretty normal. And then it looks like there's a hole even in the tooth right here. And that's pretty much what it looks like. There's a hole in the tooth. So think about if you had a hole in your tooth and the pulp of your tooth was still alive, how painful that would be every time you drank something cold or you chewed on it wrong or you know, drew air in your mouth and it passed over it. Like if you had, it'd be very uncomfortable. And so poor Fluffy, she was, this was bothering her. So we extracted it. No cure for that. We need to extract them. And again, we were very lucky that um, Fluffy's owner reported that afterwards she was doing well. She recovered uneventfully from anesthesia and tolerated her pain medication. Her extraction sites healed like we wanted them to, and she was back to crunching all her food and eating her food all at one time. Cuffy. Cuffy was brought in because her owner's friends were complaining that Cuffy's breath was awful. So the owner was like, eh, it's dog breath. Eh. But our owner's friends were like, I don't want your dog kissing me in the face. It smells bad. Um, and again, Tuffy's eating good, and she's not losing any weight, and she loves to give lots of kisses to everybody, and everybody does not love receiving them. Because this is what we found on Tuffy's teeth when um, we looked in her mouth. So you can see, again, this is another case of really bad periodontal disease, right? We have lots of calculus. 
Unfortunately for Tuffy, in her calculus and black, she's got a lot of hair all kind of wound up in there, and the hair is just another night is to let the plaque grow and, and um, fester in there. And she's lost some um, ginger bus, so it's receded back. And we're looking at her incisors, which are the teeth up front, her canines, and her premolars, and her molars back here. And on this tooth, you can see that almost the whole root has been exposed because the infection has caused the tissues to recede away from it and the bone to recede away from it as well. These teeth are mobile, so when you touch them, they wiggle a little bit. Um, and they've lost the support of the bone and soft tissue um, to keep them healthy. So these teeth are really hard for owners to keep clean once this amount of disease has occurred. This is really extensive disease, and I'm showing you extreme examples because they're the most obvious. Um, but when you have this extreme of support lost for that tooth, then there's not much we can do for them. And <clears throat> Puffy, what we did was we extracted her teeth. And you can see radiographically that she, again, has lost a lot of bone right here, that the supporting bone should come up here in this area, and it's receded all the way back there. And this is the same for our down here. You can see we have some bone loss down here. Okay. So for Tuffy, the answer was to extract her teeth. Um, and that was going to get her local tissues back to health by getting rid of that chronic infection there. If her disease had not been so extensive, if she had not lost so much bone, there are some um, techniques we can use to try to save them. But probably the thing that is the very most important to into making sure her mouth stays healthy is you as the owner taking care of them. And it is easier said than done, but toothbrushing is by far the most effective means to prevent this. You just wipe in the day's plaque off with your toothbrush, and that's really all it takes. Now, that sounds pretty easy. Yet, you got to kind of encourage them to want to do this and have them get used to you brushing their teeth, right? So they don't usually just want to do it off right off the bat. So um, we try to teach our students and our owners how to encourage our clients to brush their dog's teeth. And what we um, tell you to do is start off slow, get a small toothbrush, let them lick the pet toothpaste off of it, and it comes in a variety of flavors that sound delicious, like chicken and beef and seafood. Uh, but they like it, right? So the whole goal is to get them to want to do this. And you can bribe them for sure. So you can give them a little treat, or if they like to be brushed, or if they like to be walked, or they like to be to have, throw the ball for them. So you can connect it to something they really like. So they see the toothbrush coming, they get their teeth brushed, then they get something positive that they really enjoy, and hopefully everybody gets in the routine of having it done. Some dogs really don't mind at all. Some dogs, maybe not as willing to participate. Some cats, a few cats, they'll let you do it. Other cats, think your cats would let you do it? One says no go, one says no go. Think your dogs will let you do it? No go on your dogs, maybe yes on your dogs. I had a Karen Terrier, and I uh, brushed his teeth yep. periodically. Yep. And he never, ever, ever liked it. No, <laughs> no. So. It, it, sometimes they're just annoyed that, no. oh, why? Don't you know? I am a dog. I should not have to have my teeth brushed. But when you see how bad their teeth can get, it really goes a long ways to really helping them stay in good health. Now, everybody likes getting Tuppy's kisses. <laughs> And um, this is an example, the cheetah at the Sunset Zoo. Uh, the um, zookeepers noticed that she was picking her food up a little bit differently, and it was time for her annual exam. And so they have to anesthetize them to do their annual exams, obviously. And what they found was, and this is a pretty common tooth injury, that she had broken her canine teeth because she's picking her food up from a variety of places, and when they pick their food up off the hard ground, sometimes they break their teeth doing it. So here she is, and she has been, got, she was darted, and that dart right there 
um, <clears throat> releases an anesthetic agent into her muscle and then she will go to sleep. Um, they have confined her to a smaller area in her kennel, so in her enclosure, so that they could effectively guard her. And then once she is out, they're going to put the oxygen mask on her, which is flowing oxygen and anesthetic agent both, so we can keep her asleep. And then we'll put her on the gurney so we can transport her. And then she'll get intubated, just like our small animal patients, or if you have to be anesthetized, you will be intubated as well. And then we can fully evaluate her teeth. And um, large cats come with the same number of teeth as your house cat does, just a very bigger version of them. So they come with 30 teeth. And you can see from our picture, this canine tooth is a more normal length, but she's broken the little tip off of it here. But this one down here is broken with pulp exposure, and that one, and that one. She also ended up with a really big fracture that went all the way down the back side of that tooth, and that tooth is, was extracted. Oops. And here is a picture of root canal therapy being done on them. So the benefit of the root canal therapy is the animal gets to keep the crowns and the roots of their teeth in place so they can pres pre preserve the function of those teeth. So your pets have limited jobs they have to do, right? They are, their jobs are to um, be enjoyable pets and to eat their food and go outside and go to the bathroom and enjoy, be good company for you. These guys, their jobs might be different than that. And so they may be, have a different um, level of importance of whether they keep their teeth or not. So we try to maintain their normal dentition um, for our captive wildlife pets. And doing root canals are a great way to get rid of the infected pulp and maintain, be able to keep their teeth. So, most veterinarians um, that graduate from veterinary school do teeth cleaning on their patients, or if they do equine practice, float their horse's teeth. Um, if you have a special interest in dentistry, you can become a board-certified veterinary dentist. And these uh, individuals have extra training in oral diseases. And they um, then will end up dealing with probably the more severe cases and more um, uh, technically demanding procedures to be done for their patients. Um, and so they will go through a residency training, which is either three to six years, depending on whether it's an on-site or non-traditional residency program. Um, you have a list of cases that you have to complete. Most of the time you have to write a paper or do a research project to go with that. And then there's an extensive exam to take afterwards that says, yes, you do know what you're talking about. This is a really nice uh, website. If you have interest in any sort of oral problem in your pet, there's a whole bunch of information on this website for you to go to. They have great pictures. Um, and it's a nice way to get some information that's readily available for you. Whether it is your veterinarian going to this website or you, um, it is displayed easily and um, is very informative. So you might like to do veterinary dentistry if you really like gross things, because you can see a better part of the stuff we think we see are pretty gross. Um, but mostly, we uh, find it a very fulfilling um, job because it makes our patients feel better. So after we can identify a problem and we can treat them for it, most of the time, our patients feel better and our owners are happy that their um, pets feel better. Do you guys have any questions? So do you have a private practice? I work at K-State, uh -huh. and I, um, I am not a boarded veterinary dentist. I am a general practitioner with an interest in dentistry. So I teach the students basic dentistry. So we do a lot of um, cleanings and radiographs and um, extractions and those kind of things. Um, our soft tissue surgeons will do most of the tumor removals, so if, um, 
If they come in and they have a mass in their mouth that we identify at our cleaning, lots of times I biopsy it while I'm there so I can tell everybody what we're dealing with. And then we get directed to whether they need a CT scan or they, what they need to identify how extensive the disease is. And then they usually go to our soft tissue surgeons to have a maxillectomy or mandibulectomy or some sort of advanced procedure done. Um, the veterinary dentists do orthodontics for some animals, and um, most of the time, those procedures are done not so they have nice straight teeth that are attractive to look at, like is important for us, right? Because um, there's a big social dynamic for us in having a beautiful smile. Uh, but for our patients, our patients, it's all about pain-free function. And so we want them to be able to open and close their mouth without it being painful. And sometimes their teeth are malaligned enough that that's not happening. And if their owners are interested in trying to keep all their teeth and get them lined up correctly, then we have some things we can do to help them be more comfortable. Any other questions? I can check with you. Okay. You just never know what's going to walk in the door every day. <laughs> it's a surprise. It's a surprise. Most of the time, I think most of my owners don't realize that their pet has a problem. And they oftentimes feel bad when they realize there's a problem. And I don't think you should feel bad. I think you should be glad that you brought them in, and then we'll fix the problem yeah. for them. Right. That it. Yep. 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 And the one tooth where you saw that she had broken it off and had the draining track, mm -hmm. um, we see those so commonly because they're offered things that are too hard to chew on. So if the, if the toy is... <clears throat> not dentable or doesn't get soft when they chew on it, then they can break their teeth on it. Because think how hard they're chewing. The forces that they crush their toys with are really much higher than we generate in our mouths. And what do you recommend for, um, like, give a dog a certain treats and stuff that to clean their teeth? Mm -hmm. So there are a variety of dental products that are available. Um, if you go to the Veterinary Oral Health Council, this is a group of veterinary dentists that reviews information from companies that prove their product is doing what it says it's doing. And most of the products have a little seal on them that says VOHC seal. Oh. It has a great website with a list of food and some other products. Oh. Um, there are some brand new products out too that um, haven't made it to, to them yet because they've just come out. Marielle has a really nice one that's a Aura Vet Hygiene Chew, Greenies, we've heard of Greenies. Um, uh, Hills, Hills Pet Food just came out with one that's kind of in a star shape and very similar to Greenies. Um, the CET company, Burback owns them. They have a variety of chews and dental um, rinses and um, things like that that are helpful. Anytime you give them chew products like that, though, it can cause problems for them. So if they swallow pieces that are too big for them, it can get stuck in their esophagus. Um, most of the products now are designed to dissolve when they get to the stomach, but if they swallow a piece that's too big that doesn't make down to their stomach, this is probably the biggest problem. Um, so they need to be supervised and you need to know how they eat them. Um, and uh, any of them can cause GI upset too. So some dogs, you know, the product, there's nothing really wrong with the product, but that particular dog gets diarrhea or it vomits or something like that. So you have to kind of monitor what's happening and avoid bones, antlers, nylon bones, they're too hard. Too hard. Yeah. Real, yeah, real bones. Yep. They're just too hard. Ham bones. Too hard. Pork, pork spare ribs. <laughs> too hard. Yeah. Uh, okay, you can 
this all the time. Sure. So he just swallows it down. He's so excited. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So we're giving me a treat. Of Willie Prater disease. Willie Prater disease. Prater really that people that uh, are born with this insatiable appetite, nothing uh, to okay. eat everything. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, we we laugh about our. Um, our Brutus, because we think he has really craters. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a beagle? Yeah. He, yeah. yeah, he, yeah he and yeah. every other beagle, right? Yeah. They're like yeah. nose to the ground, yeah. food. Oh, all the time. All the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. labs too. <laughs> Super food motivated. Yeah. yeah. Right. Might help you in training them. Oh, yeah, I think your shape hands are really good. Right? But don't well, try they are even if you don't want to give them anything, just walk up and just like give you some bit. Right. He's hopeful, isn't he? Hopeful. Yeah. Oh, there might be a treat involved. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I want to thank Dr. Artser for coming.